turn out for Saturday yeah. night. Um, in fact, 11 o'clock, I'm usually not showered and, and up, up peppy and up and around. I mean, I'm awake and moving, but I'm not showered and up and around. <laughs> so this is new for me. Um, but yeah, Larry, did you want me to introduce myself and say a few uh, things? Or? If you like, uh, I think everybody here probably knows you. Oh, but, maybe uh, this is Professor. Okay. Professor here in Great Gilbert, uh, from Knox College, in the Art History Department. And uh, he and uh, Katie on our board, and I ostensibly, although I didn't do any work with this time, picked the show out of our permanent collection. So Greg happily uh, researched and is going to share his wisdom about what you're seeing in the world. Well, thank you, Larry. Um, and I should say, Larry actually had. Actually, um, actually hung the show. So um, oh, Ralph, uh, yeah, Ralph, Ralph and Larry actually did the hanging. Um, I did select pieces, um, and, but but Larry, you certainly put a lot of effort and work into this uh, exhibit. So I want to thank you for your work on, on the show. Um, thank you, Larry. Well, I was going to say, yeah. My, so I'm Greg Gilbert. I do teach art history at Knox. I'm part of the art department, art and art history. Department. I, I, I made them na also name it Art History about eight, nine years ago <laughs> to recognize the fact that it was also Art History in the department. Uh, my area, I actually teach the entire Art History major. Uh, but my specialized area of, of research is abstract expressionism, specifically the work of Robert Motherwell. But I've also done research and curated exhibits on WPA art um, and also regionalism. And in fact, I, I just wrote an essay on Grant Wood that's going to be published in the book in the fall. So I do have a background on yeah, Midwestern art, regionalist art. Um, I just wanted you to, to know that. Um, you know what I'm going to do is I was going to go ahead and start with these three pieces here. So again, you guys, I, 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 was, I did kind of conceive of this as a more mobile gallery talk. So I hope you don't mind. If you do want to sit down, you can do that. But, um, but I thought I would start with these pieces. and. The reason is that um, they do; these pieces do reflect this movement of regionalism, which, in, in many people's mind, does typify this notion of the Midwestern art. The first thing I was going to say, though, to kind of pull back and put this in more of an historical context, it's interesting. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was um, there was sort of a movement um, in the United States to really give more attention to Midwestern art. In fact, there was a group uh, that formed in the, I think it was in maybe, I think in the 1870s, 1880s. It was called the, um, the Society of Western Artists. And this was a group of artists that were based in Chicago, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Denver, um, Detroit. And the whole idea was that uh, there, there was this feeling that Midwestern artists needed to kind of challenge a little bit of this elitism of the East Coast. The idea that, uh, that the only American art that was really mattered was what was in New York City. And so these Midwestern artists just, you know, they kind of felt like I need to kind of embrace my identity as a Midwestern artist and really advocate and promote the value of Midwestern art. So they formed this society just to really kind of, I think, just really advocate for Midwestern art. Then in the early 20s, um, I'm sorry, in the early 20th century, actually in the 20s and 30s was a group called the Prairie Printmakers that formed in Kansas that included Berger Sanzane, the artist Berger Sanzane, for example. Um, and uh, it was, again, a similar idea, this, this idea of really advocating and promoting the value of Midwestern art, Midwestern subjects, by forming a, a group that could support each other and advocate for each other. And in fact, you guys, my first little catalog, when I was, I, I was actually an um, undergraduate in art history at the University of Kansas. And the Spencer Museum of Art there did a little show of the Prairie for Makers. And, that, and I actually wrote a catalog. And so at the age of 20, that was my first publication, wrote a catalog on the Prairie for Makers. Um, but then what I wanted to do was go ahead and shift it over. So um, the real major movement that really focused attention on Midwestern art was a movement, a trend known as regionalism, sometimes called the American scene. And that did begin in the 20s, the 30s. Um, the major artists associated with regionalism were um, Thomas Hart Benton from Missouri, um, Grant Wood from Iowa, um, and then uh, John Stuart Curry from Kansas. And the way the movement started is beginning in the 20s, um, after World War I, 
the United States kind of went through a period of what I would call sort of xenophobia and isolationism. Um, I think because of World War I, the United States just got so tired of its involvement with international politics, international culture. It just kind of went through this isolationist phase of wanting to pull back from international politics, its association with European culture, and just really kind of focus on, its, on itself. For Americans just to really kind of focus on themselves, even go back and develop a sense of pride of being American, and really thinking about what are distinctive and singular American values, American points of view. And so there began to be just this focus on American history. Um, and I should say before I get into this that this kind of Americanism, this attitude of Americanism was intensified by the Depression. Um, and what happened was it was really kind of this feeling that Americans needed to focus on their own history and kind of really look back at their own historical experience and kind of look at, well, how did we, how did Americans withstand the hardships and the challenges of the past? Also, too, focusing on, well, what really defined American values and American national character? The idea that Americans needed to draw from these values, um, and again, kind of the sense of their own national identity, as a way to survive and withstand these economic struggles of the Depression. Um, and what's interesting, what happened was, is that American values became to be equate, equated with the Midwest, mm. <laughs> Midwestern values. So again, they, so Americans were saying, well, you know what, East Coast culture, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, East Coast culture is really a European culture. You know, it's an urban European culture. It doesn't really reflect a lot of maybe what are more indigenous American values. So, and, I, and again, I'm not sure this is true, but they began to promote the Midwest as being um, really more typical of America. <laughs> and, and, and what they began to do is promote some of these American values, and I'm putting quotation marks, because again, I think these are generalizations, that American values that, are, that would be, say, uh, reflected in the Midwest would be this idea of a, a work ethic you know, this emphasis on a strong work ethic, religious faith, or a sense of community, this idea that people needed to band together and collectively support each other, uh, again, was associated with societies in the Midwest. But it was felt that these values were the values that were of what were gonna be needed to really kind of fortify the nation, pull the nation together, to really get through this economic crisis and social crisis of the Depression. So you guys, regionalism then, um, this is, this is going to really reflect this trend of regionalism. Thomas Hart Benton um, was one of the major regionalists. This is a, a work called The Meeting. And Benton's work did tend to be more humorous, satirical, kind of making fun of kind of aspects of Midwestern life. And if you see here, this meeting, there's, uh, looks like maybe a civic group is meeting and this guy's pontificating and probably talking about maybe some sort of problem with the town or something. It's religion. Uh, well, you know, it could be it could be a re religious revivalist meeting. Oh, oh hey, <laughs> hey Mary Lee, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Okay. Hey Mary Lee, you know, it, so it could be it could be like a, re a religious revivalist kind of meeting. But I guess what's going on here, this guy's again is maybe either pontificating or preaching, but the audience looks pretty bored. You know, <laughs> they're not too engaged with what's kind of going on. So I think he's making fun of uh, the fact that in the Midwest, because of the small societies, maybe people get maybe a little bit carried away with their own importance within the community, and he's kind of making fun of, of that a little bit. I'm going to jump to this piece here. This is George Schreiber, who um, was also very active during the regionalist movement. This is a, these are all lithographs, by the way, lithographic prints, and maybe I should say that in the 30s, because of um, the WPA, um, it was the idea that art should be more democratic. So rather than, again, this idea of that art should only be accessible to an elite, upper class audience, it was the idea that no, art, uh, there sh art should be democratized, um, everyday Americans should have access to art, that art should be something that should enrich the life, the life of every American. So printmaking, because it is cheaper, you know, you can, you can mass produce prints, they're affordable, Printmaking became a, a very major art form in the 30s during the, during the WPA period and during regionalism. So these are all these lithographic prints. Schreiber's an interesting artist. He was from Belgium, so a European artist that um, came to the United States, originally from Belgium. And here you've got this scene of, um, you know, I'm assuming it's a farming couple. 
I mean, it could be a farm hand, and it looks like what's happening, here's a farm hand that's been plowing the field, and he's being brought his lunch. <laughs> There's a pail, and he's drinking, you know, water from a cup, probably. It looks like his lunch has been brought to him. And this could be just, again, a woman bringing a farm hand his lunch. But it looks like, to me, it seems to be really, a, it seems to really reflect the fact that they're a couple. And there seems to be this strong bond between the figures, which I think is symbolic of, again, this idea of the strong bond of their relationship to nature and the earth. Um, and uh, a lot of this regionalist art, and I would say this is true of Schreiber, it did tend to idealize um, and heroicize Midwestern farming life. And I think you can kind of see this here. You see, again, uh, he's been plowing here, horse run plow. You've got, again, this line of the plow marks that go off into the distance. So again, you have this dramatic, receding sort of line of plow marks suggesting that the big open land of the Midwest, the massive labor that it's going to take for him to plow <laughs> and plow the field. And in fact, there's a European artist, um, some of you might be familiar, there was an artist in the 19th century, a realist artist by the name of Millet, French artist Millet, who did a lot of works of art of uh, French peasants laboring and working in the fields. I actually, I actually think this is a, a quote from Millet. Um, and, and what Millet oftentimes did was he did oftentimes glorify and heroicize the peasant worker. And I think there's a lot of this language in the print. Uh, but if you see here, you've got, here's, you know, the, the farmer here, he's got this muscled arm that he's drinking from. And the plow almost looks like an extension of his body. And it, I, I do think this is a statement about just, yeah, kind of the heroic strength of the American farmer. Uh, but this is very typical of this more idealized, kind of glorified imagery of regionalism. If you guys take a look at this piece, this